Yeah. Well, I guess we'll stop then. <laughs> but just even I'll be quiet. Well, hopefully um, we'll get some sound from the computer. I think, <laughs> well, I don't know if Jay has actually turned the microphone on or not. Cause I think he said when everyone was talking there he turns it off because he feels like it's too noisy but sometimes you can actually hear what people are saying. Yeah, Jay runs this all by himself, our club president. So sometimes he forgets to turn the sound on. Yeah, well, I'm going to be back after this week. So I told him, I mean, I don't know anything about it, but obviously I'm happy to help and whatever, because I know how hard it is to be the president and then not have anybody helping. So. So I hope y'all can hear us now online. Uh, if you could mute, that'd be wonderful. All right, well, welcome to the club meeting. Um, we are a couple minutes late, so we're gonna have to get moving quick. I apologize about that, but it was really hard to get everyone's attention because we're all so excited to be back again. Welcome to uh, the first meeting in August, and we'll get going. Um, As always, we're recording, so just your fair warning here. We have a big agenda today, so we're going to push through it as quick as we can. Um, that means double time on the pledge. I'm sorry, Bob. Um, so we had our social bell has been yelled, and we're on to Bob's favorite. Let's go to Pledge of Allegiance. All right. You'll start us off, Bob. Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Wonderful. Is it the All right, I've got Bob Gronig up here for a rotary minute, and I gave him a nice logo since he didn't want any other company men. Okay, it's D-Day. I have to order peaches tomorrow, so I need your orders. Uh, we are approaching, but short, of what we did last year. We did about 950 boxes last year. We're just short of 900 this year. So I'm sure we can make up 50 boxes in very short order. Um, the peaches, as you, if you've been watching the news, uh, getting from uh, Palisades to this side of the state is very difficult. Uh, I-70 is closed. Some of the other routes are closed. So they're taking that into consideration. Uh, Littleton and Niwa's peaches are actually coming this week, and uh, they'll be delivered on Friday night and Saturday morning. Our peaches will show up next to King Supers next week on the 14th at probably 6.30 in the morning because they're coming over on Friday. So as in past years, those that want to come over and help unload, come over. Those that want to stay a little bit with me, because we'll be there until probably 1 o'clock or so, and then we'll have to move any peaches that people forgot to pick up over to Meals on Wheels. Meals on Wheels has been nice enough to let us use their refrigerated area. And then you can just send your people to Meals on Wheels on Monday. They'll uh, 
they'll be open. In fact, they'll even be open on Sunday. It, it's in Boulder, not Lafayette. Yeah, the, the Meals on Wheels that these are is in, on Boulder, in Boulder, at the new Meals on Wheels, which is out what was formerly called McKenzie Junction. If you've never been there, it's 3705 Canfield. Um, it's uh, in the north part of Boulder, right where the iris goes out to the diagonal. Um, we will be, uh, for, for some strange reason, uh, jam didn't sell very well this year compared to past years. Um, Nywon went crazy with their sales. We're lagging way behind. We will have two spots on, fr on Saturday and on Sunday, the 14th and the 15th, where we will need volunteers to help. We will have uh, Jim Sybil's RV out at the medical center on the corner of Lowell and Baseline, as we did past years. I think we may have enough people there, but it, it, it's always good to have people around just to chat. Uh, we will have signs out. We'll have probably, depending on how many peach orders lag, uh, when I put the order in, we'll have a couple of hundred extra boxes of peaches that we'll be selling on Saturday and Sunday between what, 10 and two? 10 and two on Saturday and Sunday at the medical center. We're also going to be on the corner of uh, Arapahoe and 119th. Um, again, as we were last year. Uh, I think you're gonna be there on Saturday. Joe's gonna be there on Saturday um, and he could use some help. And you, you, you're not sure about Sunday? Okay, we will need we will need some folks there on Sunday to uh, to help sell peaches, and we'll be moving the peaches back and forth between the medical center and uh, and Arapaho. So uh, this is your chance to uh, finish everything up in grand style. This is our big fundraiser. Uh, Leslie needs money to be able to spend next year. So uh, let's let's get to it. Any, any questions? Get me your numbers, please. Those of you who have not given me your numbers, get me your numbers. If you have stragglers, don't worry about it. We'll have some extras, but it would be nice to have all of the numbers that were not on uh, the Square PayPal site uh, sometime today or tomorrow. Yes, Niwat bought from us. No, 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 no. The, the Niwat numbers are separate from ours. Yep. Thank you so much, Bob. We really appreciate the update and everyone's getting super excited. Uh, I see probably about eight different notifications a day of different orders that come through the website. So that's pretty exciting, but hopefully by the end of today, we'll be able to wrap that up and close down the online orders. Um, well, yeah, Friday afternoon. Um, all right. Well, now it's time for guest introductions. I've already passed the mic back. So if uh, we have any guests here with us today, please stand up as a Rotarian and introduce them. Yes, I have a guest. I thought I'd introduce myself first. I haven't been here and I see <laughs> a lot of new faces. So it's good to be back. John Olson. <laughs> And I was a president for this club one time. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm here to uh, introduce my guest, John uh, Stringfeller. I probably, okay. And you get about a minute, I guess. You know, so. okay. Well, good morning. And uh, I just want to say thanks to John for stopping by my office a few times and introducing me to Rotary and then asking me to come join. So um, pleasure to be here. And uh, um, so John Stringfellow, um, I have an a insurance agency on the west side of Boulder. Um, I'm involved with, uh, I'm on the board with NAMI Boulder County, National Alliance on Mental Illness with uh, Boulder County. And um, really just pleasure to be here and to meet. I appreciate everybody being so uh, friendly and welcoming so far. So thank you, that's it. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Roger Cabbage, uh, founder of Global Access 2030, and I brought uh, Rob Miller, the director of Global Access 2030, to tell us a little bit this morning about what we're doing and do a quick demo on uh, what we do in the jungle and in uh, Rwanda and in Nepal. This is Rob Miller. Uh, Rob Miller, I'm a product designer with the company Loophole and also the uh, CEO of Global Access 2030 now, helping Roger to raise money and help people and I'll get more into that later. Thank you for having me. This thing on? Um, my guest is Virginia Cunningham, my friend, and uh, I'll, I'll introduce the speaker, Phil Kelly later, but Virginia is Phil's brother-in-law. And um, I'll, like I said, I'll introduce him later. Well, I didn't want to mention that because she might not make it, but anyway, uh, Phil's wife, Frances, Virginia's sister, is running late because she's supposed to be here also. Welcome, Virginia. A lot of guests. All right, if I can get Ellen, if I can get Bob, we're on to one of the more exciting aspects of any club meeting. Jay, which is, Jay. Yes, I should remember. Jay. Yeah, we, can, we can hear you, Beth, what's up? Um, I have a guest also online. Oh, we have a guest online, wonderful. So you probably can't see her, but can the group hear her? Hi, can you all hear me? Yes, the guest, the guest can be heard. Okay, great. So I, I have with me a work colleague, Kathy Robinson, who um, just sent me a note when I asked her to buy some peaches and said, I'm really interested in learning more about rotaries. So she's here uh, and she might want to say something. Hi, so I'll just um, say a quick hello. My name is Kathy Robinson. I work with Beth at uh, CU Boulder at Jilla. And um, I'm also on the board of the Rocky Mountain Peace and Justice Center. And I've, uh, I, from this area, I grew up in Denver and Boulder. And um, so, yeah, I'm just really happy to be here and learning more about, uh, about the Rotary Club. So thanks for having me. Thank you, Kathy. It's great to have you here. Sorry, we don't have a second projector up, so we can't see guests online yet, but hopefully soon. All right, now for the installation for Ellen, and we got Bob. Okay. Um, well, I guess not. So we'll we'll move on to Happy Bucks, I guess, and uh, we'll go from there. So, or maybe announcements. Maybe we've got some district announcements too. We'll start with Happy Bucks. Yeah, so just for those who are not aware, the microphone is for people on Zoom. We don't have a speaker system here available, so we don't have a way to project our voices from the microphones back out to the crowd. Um, well, but before Happy Bucks, I see Ellen's back, so let's jump back real quick and go to installation. Perfect. All right, Bob, take it away. No, no, Bob, not that Bob. Today we are honored to induct Ellen Member as a new international member assigned to Rotary Club uh, Flatirons of Boulder. Welcome to Rotary. There are several milestones that are life altering. We go through life so focused on education, career or family, but at some point we realize we must give back to society. Um, we believe that joining Rotary is one of those life-altering moments. Ellen, you have already demonstrated the most important primary object of Rotary, service above self, through your nonprofit Passing Hats that provides knitted head covers to cancer patients who have lost their hair due to chemotherapy. You are an also an active volunteer, I believe, in several other organizations. 
And so she is a busy person. And you have been chosen for membership in Rotary at the Flatirons Rotary Club of Boulder because your fellow members believe you to be a leader in your community, one who demonstrates the foundations of our club. While membership in Rotary is an honor and a privilege, it involves corresponding obligations. I know because of your busy schedule, it's not always easy for you to attend our weekly meetings and Rotary has de-emphasized the importance of attendance, but we ask that you make it a priority to attend as often as you can. As a Rotarian, it becomes your duty to carry the Rotary ideals and principles of service to your community, your friends, and business associates, and the people you engage in the practice of the vocation you represent. The community will know and judge Rotary through your example in character and in service. And we are proud to accept you as a member because we believe the principles and objects of Rotary will be safe in your keeping. Rotary is an organization of the few in service of many. You are now one of us who strongly believe in service above self. And we know that we will receive much from you in help and service that you will enable us to be better Rotarians. And we most heartily offer you the right hand of Rotary Fellowship. On behalf of the Rotary Club of Boulder, may I offer you the Rotary Wheel. And I'll give this to your mentor so that she may pin this on you. The Rotary Wheel, which faces inward for friendship and fellowship and outward in service to our community and the world. Okay, on behalf of the Rotary Club of Boulder, Flatirons Rotary Club of Boulder and the Rotary International, may I welcome you to our world. With the presentation of this pin, I declare you to be a member of the Flatirons Rotary Club of Boulder. The new member packet I will give you. And fellow Rotarians, please put your hands together in applause. I present to you our newest member, Ellen Member. And Ellen, you may say a few words. Your turn. My turn. No pressure, right? <laughs> I just wanted to thank Lou for inviting me going back. I think it was three years ago I had come to my first meeting here. Life had gotten busy, COVID hit. And when Lou had asked me again, I just absolutely needed to join this group. So thank you so much for having me. It's greatly appreciated. OK. Hooray, always amazing and always such an exciting experience at the club meetings. Um, well, unfortunately, there's a little bit of business, so we'll get through it quick. Um, Club announcements for Joe under community service. We've got the Habitat for Humanity event and they need to email Joe, which is what it says up here. And Joe will make sure you're signed up under his aspis. But then also you have to sign up under the Habitat site. And that's also the United Way site of the second link, right? So is that just for you? Just for you. Okay, so sign up through Habitat, email Joe, so Joe can make sure that he, you get counted within his numbers for the event. We also have the Isabel Road cleanup, which will be September 25th. And um, that one is another email Joe situation, right? So then we'll email Joe and Joe will add you to the list of people volunteering. Um, 
Beth, I know I have you online, um, but Beth has grant committee updates, which is one, again, let her know if you want to join. I think right now we're up to about six people. Um, and then also a new announcement, which is if you have a district grant idea, Beth wants to help work on it. There's money on the table for um, donations that we've made to have a district grant that's funding that's matched from the district. So if you have an idea, please reach out to Beth. Beth Kroger, and Beth will help you formulate that idea and see if we can get into an application for the club here. Wonderful. And Literacy Award, this one's fast approaching. So the Literacy Award application deadline is August 15th. Um, those come to me. And if you have any questions, Marcia should be able to answer those questions, okay? Um, we also had a couple updates for Greenhouse Scholars, just um, some events coming up. So in a couple of days here, four days, we've got a Meet the Scholars event. And I think a few of our members will be there. So if you're interested, um, we have information. And Maribeth, you, um, yeah, Maribeth had sent me this information. So yeah, the website has all the uh, links to go to these events. There's a, there's a virtual Meet portion too, right? From what I saw on that link. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Yeah, so Anne threw it up on Facebook. If you're using our Facebook page, it'll be there. And then there's also a bike ride on the 28th of August, which is the Venus de Miles bike ride. So definitely go and sign up for that if you're interested. I know that our district does a lot of bike rides. So if you uh, don't have your bike tuned up, let me know, I'll help. That's not a problem in our club. Awesome. So yeah, if you're not even, if you're not riding Joe and Mary Beth are saying, please come and volunteer too, they need help. So, all right, we have a couple district announcements that I'll throw up real quick, which again, more East Troublesome firework is being done by the district. So if you have time and you wanna go do some raking, um, they're definitely looking for that as they're putting together new trails and doing some cleanup. Um, there's, on the 10th, there's a district virtual meeting on Rotary 101. I just went to one of those virtual meetings last night, which is the one on hybrid meetings. It was interesting. Um, so I think that you can learn a lot if you're interested in getting some more information about Rotary. That comes out through the district update emails. If you're not seeing that, let me know and I will get you on that list. Uh, there's a September 25th bike ride event that's a fundraiser throughout the district. And that one is part of the typical Denver Century system. It's, it's put on through Woo Humanity. And we, um, Rotary has a leg of that. So basically, if you want to sign up, there's a bunch of people in Rotary spandex riding their bikes around. So true. They, they did ask for some volunteers for hydration stations, setting up things like the start stop areas and check ins. So if you have time to do that too, that'd be super helpful. Uh, the last one for Pelio Plus, we have a Rockies game scheduled, which is September 26th. That's with the district as well. Um, and that game I believe is against San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so if you, if you love or don't like the Giants, that's also a good reason to go. Um, and that one will be some of the proceeds from that based on the number of attendees that we have, will go back towards a Pelio Plus fund um, donation from the district. All right. Well, those are announcements. Woo, got through a lot of them. Thank you all for supporting information. Now we're on to our happy bucks demonstration. Got about two minutes. Yep. Two minutes. So please. And then, um, while the filter's going, we will do our normal happy bucks. It's me again. Again, um, hello everyone. I want to thank you again for having me a second time, and it's great to see some familiar faces in person this time. Um, I want to thank you a lot for your uh, previous grant. Uh, it went a long way to helping people. I have a really great thank you from the Maya Hun people that I wanted to share with you, but we couldn't get the video to load. So afterwards, if you want to hear what the Maya Huna language sounds like, which there are only 500 natives left in the world speaking this, um, I'll run it on my laptop. Um, this year, as we move forward in the new grant and from all your gracious donations, we're able to push the dollar even further. Um, 
we're now able to, because of a reduced cost and a more durable filter, we are actually able to buy the filters. And previously we had our other nonprofit fund the buckets. We're actually able to fund the buckets and buy fuel to get them down the river, which means that our friends in Peru who are now facing the third wave of coronavirus, uh, we can push them to do even more because we're able to fund the entire project and it comes at no charge to them whatsoever as opposed to the previous uh, grant. So with that, uh, I know we're getting the happy bucks this time uh, for the this month. And I really wanna give a, a thank you for it. It's really touching to me and all the effort we do. Um, means a lot. Well, it's our pleasure to donate our happy bucks for all of August. Um, we love watching the filter go as we're here too. It's, it's meditative. So thank you so much for coming and presenting it to us. Bob, if you'd like to start with the happy bucks, we'll be watching the filter throughout the rest of the meeting, but thank you so much. We very much appreciate you. No. I added filled water from uh, my stream near my house into that. Yeah, it looked pretty dirty when it went in. <laughs> Thanks. All right, Bob Crothers, I see you got a check here for us. Uh, finally, we found a banker who would make a loan. First day. Clean water. Yeah, I appreciate it. All right. Bye. For uh, Kim and Amy for the delicious treats. <laughs> GA 2030. Thank you all for supporting us. Thank you very much. Two things. Number one, I'm a personal friend with all the lifeguards of Waterworld. I'm the only one that got tipped over seven times in seven different rides with my grandkids. So they all know me by my first name. It's called Kim. Second, second, for all you to ask about my son, August 30th, he'll have his kidney transplant. Congrats, Lou. I had a birthday yesterday. <laughs> And it is a tradition in this club to donate a dollar for every year you've been on the earth. Is that the sisters of the dollar? Yes. Uh, a lot older than I look. <laughs> it's not required for new members, but it is. Thank you, Rusty. This is a thank you to Leslie, who operated on our dog, Buzz, and is feeling much better. Woo! This is because of the wind down of beaches, another week and I'll be done. This is for last month's happy dollars. Thank you going to Alzheimer's to my Alzheimer's team and the Alzheimer's walk. Uh, it was a check for $336. Yeah. $20 like uh, John, uh, I'll introduce myself because I'm not here very often. <laughs> I'm Val Patterson, a longtime member of the club, like John, a charter member. Uh, this season of uh, traveling for my wife and I appears that it will continue into the new year, so my attendance will be sporadic, but I'm glad to see you when I can. Well, we're hopeful to see you online maybe once in a while, too. Well, as membership chair, I'm glad to see all of the people who bought guests keep it up. You're all welcome to come back. I have a quick happy ending story. Our little 10 year old grandson was exposed to COVID at his day camp. Of course, he's too young to get vaccinated, et cetera. Uh, but the good news is, is that he just uh, got tested a couple of days ago and he's negative. And so we're very happy about that. Happy ending. For 20 to the group. Um, I just was thinking this morning how grateful I am for the Rotary family. Ellen, who's just become our new member, volunteered at the garage sale before she was even a member. This young lady, 
unbelievable. And we do have a lot to be grateful for because, you know, I've been in this club for about 17 years, and people have been there for me that I meet with, and I hope I've been there for them. But it's a lot to be grateful for. I just have... I just have a happy dollar, although with the ozone count in the morning, it's really hard to live in Boulder right now. <laughs> so. Thank you all so very much. Those really great happy bucks. And you can see the filter still going. Um, one little announcement for Lou real quick is that um, we, we're we going to not have the football game. And I know that's really sad, the buff USC game, but I think that the decision was that it just doesn't make sense with the Delta variant and the way things are going, it's probably not gonna happen anyway. So we just, we canceled that for anyone who was already hoping on or scheduling it, that's not happening with our club. So. All right, well, looks pretty good over there. But with that being said, while it's going, we're gonna have an awesome presentation that's also water related. So um, we'll get that all loaded up here in just one second. And uh, I'd love to have Mike come up and introduce our guest speaker today. Thanks. Um, I'm going to make this real short. Uh, it's been a, my honor to introduce uh, my friend Phil Kelly, uh, who uh, had a 30 year career in the Merchant Marine, graduated from uh, Texas A&M College of Marine Science in 1971. He also has a commission in the uh, U.S. Navy. Uh, and uh, he'll also talk about the relationship between the Merchant Marine uh, and the Navy. I uh, retired in year 2000 after sailing 30 years as a cadet, able seaman, and deck officer. Phil, it's up to you. Look for you here. All right. And if you stand up, you should see yourself on the, on the camera. Is this on? All good. All good. Okay. So when I was approached about doing this talk, uh, part of this problematic is condensing or squeezing down a few years worth of work, 30 minutes. Uh, but this is the end result, and I'll. Uh, <clears throat> Unfortunately, there's no speaker system in here, and we can't. We have to talk over the HVAC system. So if you just project a little of that mic. You have a little you don't even need the handout. I don't need this. You don't need it. Oh, okay. You can just speculate. All right. So in the uh, U.S., the Merchant Marines is often confused with the U.S. military, especially in uh, landlocked states such as Colorado. So the primary job description of the U.S. Merchant Marines is the transportation of goods and services on the oceans and rivers of the world. However, in times of war, commercial vessels can be part of the military effort. So <clears throat> how vital is the Merchant Marines? It's estimated that international shipping carries about 90% everything you wear, eat, or consume. The current shortage of just about everything in the U.S. points to just how vital commercial shipping is. And unfortunately, nothing personifies this importance like the headline news of March 29th, when the 1,300-foot So the Suez Canal handles some 13% of all seaborne trade. She had set sail for Europe from China on March 8th, and for six long days, 
the strategic, the strategic choke point was closed to shipping. Lloyd's of London, the largest marine insurer in the world, estimated that this, this stranded vessel held up $9.6 billion worth of trade a day. Or to put this phenomenal figure in another way, that would be $400 million and 3.3 million tons of cargo an hour. The alternative was to sail around the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa. However, that would add three to five days to the voyage and cost some $300,000 more in fuel. And in the marine industry, the single biggest cost is in operating a vessel is the fuel. Also, the Cape of Good Hope has a dangerous reputation and it's well-deserved. Why? Because of fierce winds, heavy currents, rocky shorelines, and heavy traffic. In 2003, the Sealand Express, a company that I worked for, dragged its anchor and was run aground in high winds. So the joint salvage effort to refloat the Ever Given was by a Dutch salvage company and the Suez Canal Authority, or SCA. It was originally estimated to take weeks for the salvage work. Salvage work is, gr is a grinding around the clock that is both dirty and dangerous. I know this from personal experience and I'll get back to it. However, this salvage job got some help from mother nature when she stepped in with a supermoon. A supermoon happens when the Earth and the moon's elliptical orbits are both in alignment with the sun. It gives the Earth higher high tides and lower low tides. The Suez Canal is open to the ocean and experiences tides. The extra high tide of a foot and a half was just an ever given. But the giant ever given was not allowed to go on its merry way. It was impounded by the Suez Canal Authority and sent to anchor after they had filed a $900 million compensation lawsuit against the owners. Even though the Evergreen shipping is a type owned by a Japanese conglomerate, which is not unusual in the marine industry. One billion dollar lawsuits in that industry are not uncommon because of the magnitude of what is at stake. The Ever Given was released to sale after a preliminary settlement of dollars. The final will probably be somewhere between 500 million and the original 900 million compensation asked for by the Suez Canal Authority for lost revenue. When the vessel docked in Rotterdam just this last Thursday on July 29th, she was laden with over $7 million worth of goods on board, but months late. The cargo included furniture, apparel from Tom Kalsinger and Calvin Klein, and footwear from Nike. Stores in April down or stay in the warehouse until next year with the hope that fashion doesn't change. The base catering service had $100,000 worth of commercial refrigerators aboard for distribution when COVID lockdown ended in late May. And of course that didn't happen. So what led me to a life at sea? I would say the key factor with travel. The other compensations were having to work only six months out of the year and going, coming and going. After graduate, <clears throat> after graduation from A and M, there was no lag time in getting a job. It was straight onto hydrographic survey boats to work around the globe. Unfortunately, from a mother, this was not the love boat. Let's go. 
Whoops. So for eight years, I sailed on what were considered boats. The cut point defining a boat from a ship is three, a boat is under 300 feet long and less than 1,600 gross tons. Seen uh, on licenses of that size, which are documentation for vessels. Uh, the World War II destroyer is right on this designation. So a destroyer escort would be about the size of a large boat. So how does a hydrographic survey boat work? So what you see is the survey boat shoots high pressure sound waves at the ocean floor, then picks cable that's pulled behind the vessel, which you can see in this picture right here. Then the, surf, the surveyors on board the vessel get a good profile of the seabed. Oceanography boats do this as well as oil exploration boats. One of the first hydrographic that I worked on Singapore and chartered out to Royal Dutch Shell. This for sure was one of the most enjoyable jobs of my career as we hopped from island to island working. The pay was low, but you paid no taxes because you were working out of the country. The multinational crews were young. The, de the destination's exotic and port time was a blast. I also did this type of work in the Caribbean basin, the Canadian maritime provinces and Arctic Circle and the Mediterranean when we were based out of Valletta, Malta. Because I was commissioned as an ensign in the Navy, I was in the reserves. <clears throat> the Navy's thinking was, because you're out at sea six months out of the year, it was better than sitting behind a desk pushing a pencil. The only time I was almost called up for active duty by the Navy was during the Yom Kippur War of October 1973, when reservists were put on notice or DEFCON 3 was declared. Otherwise, the Navy left me alone. <clears throat> so also in this period, I worked on another type of boat, a salvage tug called the William S. Smith out of New Orleans. It was a refit of a World War II recreation from Germany called the Windhorst and was changed from steam to diesel. We had 2,000 horse or two 5,000 horsepower Detroit diesels. A 5,000 horsepower diesel is what powers a locomotive. We also worked on what was called a Lloyd's Open End Salvage Contract. And this is where when you rescue a vessel, you own 50% of everything, including the vessel itself and the cargo. If there's time, the, the, <clears throat> the compensation is usually negotiated. However, if the vessel's sinking, like this one right here, and there's no time to negotiate, the shippers usually sign the contract and hash out the compensation later. So setting up and breaking down toes. Whoops, that's a that's the size of the boat I worked on. What happened there? Okay, here we go. So setting down, <clears throat> breaking down and setting up toes is backbreaking work. This is the back deck of a salvage tug. One of the jobs we had was towing a fully loaded Taiwanese freighter to Amsterdam from New Orleans. It had been run aground in the Mississippi River in Bennett's shaft, and rather than offload it and repair it there, they decided to make the decision to tow it to Amsterdam. So we were doing quite well in the Gulf Stream, 
But when we got north of the Azores, we ran into a North Atlantic storm. The North Atlantic is the worst ocean in the world for number and intensity of storms. So for about a week, we plowed into 40 to 50 foot seas, which would entirely cover the tug. So we were leaking from the top of the bridge all the way down to our gunnels. The speed was about two knots and that was just enough to hold her into the waves. So it was a miserable condition for both ourselves in the tug and the crew on the freighter. So in the late 70s, I transitioned from working on boats to ships and was accepted in the Masters Mason Pilots Union in 1980. Even as a junior officer on a ship, you made more money than a captain on a boat. And one of the biggest differences was having full medical and retirement benefits. Let's see if we go backwards here. My primary employer in the late 80s was the Likes Brothers Steamship Company out of New Orleans. And the backbone of their fleet was a C3 brake bolt ship. The one pictured here is going into port and you can tell because her booms are up, which means she's gonna be working cargo. This type of vessel was about 460 feet long at a 65 foot beam and a draft of 25 to 30 feet. That's draft is what the ship is underneath the water. The dead weight tonnage of this vessel was about 12,000 tons. Now, what dead weight means is it's what a vessel could carry in the way of cargo, its stores, and its fuel. Power plant for this ship was an 8,500 horsepower steam turbine, and it drove the vessel up to 19 knots, but its normal speed was about 16 because for fuel efficiency. And as I said before, fuel is probably the single biggest cost of a vessel. I fleet was built in the Avondale shipyard in New Orleans and employed some 26,000 workers. The shipyard no longer exists as shipbuilding has been outsourced just like everything else. We had a 42 man crew on this vessel and we could do all of our own repairs and maintenance. So being a brake bolt carrier like this one means that you basically discharge every uh, cargo individually. And that meant that it's important for the crew. Uh, let's go back. So let's compare the vessel that I was on to the Ever Given that got stuck in the Suez Canal. The Ever Given is a class of container vessel called the Suez Max. That means <clears throat> that the Suez Canal can take a vessel up to 240,000 gross tons. There are over 50 vessels like the Ever Given that are over that 220,000 tons. And to put that in perspective, if you take the largest ship that the US Navy has, which is a Nimitz carrier aircraft carrier, which is 10, just over 1,000 feet long and 106,000 tons, that means that the largest aircraft carries about half the size of the ever given. In the last 20 years, container vessels have doubled in size. The Ever Given has a max draft of 52 feet, but it was not that deep on March 29th when it got stuck as it was carrying only 9,000 of its 10,040 foot containers. Putting this ship's cargo end to end, 40 foot containers, if you put them end to end, you would travel from Boulder 
somewhere down around Monument Hill on I-25. It's a tremendous amount of cargo. When the Ever Given got stuck, <clears throat> those 9,000 containers represented 229,000 tons of cargo. Now remember the break bulk ship I showed you only carried about 12,000. The largest container vessel in the world, which is called the Algeciras, carries 12,000 of these containers or about 300,000 tons of cargo. They can also squeeze through the Suez Canal, but not with a full capacity. The bottom line is these mammoth vessels are really pushing the limits of the canal. So interestingly enough, the first 20 of the Suez Max container vessels I mentioned are Panamanian registry. So why would you register your vessel in Panama? Well, you do it to avoid stricter regulations of your own country. It's easy to do often online. You can employ cheap foreign labor and the owners pay no taxes, just nominal registration fees. In the process of moving from break bulk carriers to the Trans-Pacific container shipping trade in the late 80s, I sailed on a super tanker. As large as the supersized container vessels are, super tankers by far are the largest vessels in the world. The one pictured here was an LCC or a large crude carrier called the OMI Columbia, by far the largest vessel I worked on in my career. It was built in the Japanese shipyard in 1974 for a Norwegian company, and it was originally named the Susanna Onstead. Its claim to fame, it was used in, as a set 1976 remake of King Kong, starring Jessica Lange and Jeff Bridges. It took me a while to figure out why the crew would walk on deck, pat the top of the tank, and say, good morning, Kong. I thought they were a little bit crazy, but then they told me why. At 894 feet long and 139,000 deadweight tons, we carried just short of a million barrels of oil from Valdez, Alaska, with a draft of a six-story building under the water. There was a port on the west coast of the United States that can accommodate us without us reducing our draft by lightering oil into barges. Often we sailed directly to a place called Port Amarillos on the west coast, flowed our crude into a pipeline that pumped it over the mountains to the east coast side before it was carried north to Gulf and east coast U.S. refineries. The, the tank, our tanker, of course, was way too big to transit the Panama Canal. However, we were a real pipsqueak when sitting alongside the infamous VLCC, that's a very large crude carrier, Exxon Valdez up in Alaska, as she was over 1,500 feet long and just short of a half a million tons dead weight. There's a picture. There's a picture of her in. Uh, <clears throat> Prince William Sound, Alaska. They had even bigger vessels than this. They're called ULCCs, or ultra large crude carriers that can transport two to four million barrels of oil worth hundreds of millions of dollars, and they never go into port anywhere. They have to offload offshore into pipelines. Finally, I finished my career in the Trans-Pacific container trade. Typically of what I sailed on was steam the SS Sealand Enterprise, a vessel that retired when I did in 2000. The designation SS meant steamship. 
now almost all vessels are MVs or motor vessels powered by diesel engines. Diesel engines are cheaper, are a cheaper initial investment, but they wear out faster and have a higher repair cost. Steam turbines are much more reliable. The Sea Land Enterprise was an 813-foot-long ship, which is about two and a half foot long. Pretty that weighed 10 inches out of the container. That would be enough to get you from here to Costco down Lake Superior or in Superior. By today's standards, she was a small container ship. By the 90s, the crew was down to around 20 personnel as everything computerized. Out at sea, GPS satellites steered our ship. The pay was higher because everybody was working overtime. Your standard work weeks uh, were 80 hours or more. When in port, we would have 10 man gangs come aboard to do air work because maintenance of the vessel was way too big for the small crews we had. Time was drastically reduced as container terminals are extremely efficient. In our home port of Seattle, we would night two in the morning and sail within 24 hours, fully loaded for the Far East. Hardly had time to cook a beer as cargo was a priority. Like everything else in the world, technology had even matter the shipper's cargo was in the dock as long as it arrived on time. That can be very dangerous to not only the ship, but also the crew on board. There are times when I used to think that US government regulations were a pain in the butt to work under. However, in the long run, I realized when the safety of the ship and the crew were at stake, I was glad they were in place. Question. What's that now? You you could uh, load and offload the Valdez basically in about sixteen hours. Sixteen hours. Uh, Nine thousand containers on that one container boat. Uh, normally, uh, container vessels don't spend any more than about 24 hours in port. I'm impressed. <laughs> the movie Captain Phillips, what kind of problems was piracy? Uh, piracy, because it happened to a U.S. ship, uh, you know, Somalia, of course, is an area that you try and avoid. But what Captain Phillips did is he was cutting a corner coming out of the uh, Gulf of Aqaba. And uh, if he had gone and take a, a long round route, the boats that the pirates used could have never gotten to him. So one of the ways that they've kind of uh, cut down on piracy in the Somalia area is they put mercenaries on board the ships that are in, and are armed. Although one of the vessels I was on was typical. We had our own, um, you know, set of weapons on board. So we were never bothered. But as far as areas of the world, uh, the South China Sea is still by far the worst. All right. Well, it was a pleasure to have you today. We have a gift of our appreciation. Oh, thank you very much. You've been around the world, so we're putting in the palm of your hand. There you go. And it's got a little bit of a description there for Robin. So thank nice. you so much. It was a pleasure to have you. All right. Just as a reminder, before we close out, that Rob will be here for questions about the filter. And look, it's almost done. Pretty amazing. So um, thank you all for your time. And if it's Wednesday, it's Rotary. Well, I was kept trying to get you to talk louder. <laughs>
It was that. It was that. 